Good Mayor and members of the Council, I'm going to present from here today. We're going to talk to you about the FY 2023 proposed budget for the fiscal year uh, that runs October 1 this October through September 30th of next year. So the City Charter does require that the City Manager present to the City Council no sooner than or no later than 60 days of, of the fiscal year a budget for the City and so that's what we're doing today. The budget that you have in front of you, you have a presentation, you also have the budget book. Councilman Hunter just picked his up. Uh, this is uh, the summary that I'll provide you today summarizes the budget. And the highlights are the budget is balanced. Unlike the federal government, we balance our budgets here at the local and state level. Uh, the budget does address the council and the community's priorities. It focuses on public safety, streets, parks, neighborhoods, and our utilities, water and wastewater. And it is consistent with city council approved financial policies. Those were just approved last council meeting. So the organization, the city of Corpus Christi, we're a transparent organization and uh, we get our communities involved in our business and that's part of our, our cornerstone uh, hallmarks as a city. Uh, so uh, today is the presentation of the budget, but we will be engaging the community over the next two weeks uh, in the community. We know that COVID slowed this down a little bit in the, in the last two years, but we have five community hearings over the next two weeks, one in each city council district. Uh, from August 8th all the way through August 17th. You can see the locations on the screen and each one of these will start at 6 o'clock and conclude around 7 o'clock to help the community, one, understand the budget, uh, but two, get input from the community. Uh, each of the three budgets that I have done uh, with the council's engagement in the community, we've modified the budgets based on the community's interest and input at these sessions, so they're very important. Now today's a high level summary, but we do have four more meetings with the council, about three hours in length, uh, to go over the budgets. Uh, there's four work sessions, all of them will be here in these city council chambers uh, from the hours of nine to noon. So for those that maybe that this is your second budget, just to remind uh, the council members how the budget is developed. And so our budget office uh, develops what we call a base operating and capital needs budget. Uh, early in the year that's shared with the departments. Uh, once that is set, I meet with all the departments, all 28 of them, to review their business plan, uh, what they need, uh, what they want, what they think they might need, and then we reconcile based on revenues how we can uh, continue the base services, uh, but also improve service delivery uh, based on the community's needs, our available resources, and the council's input. And so I meet with every department head and their team. And I do want to recognize as well, uh, police union president Scott Leeton and fire union president uh, Johnny Stobbs uh, for being part of that process as well. So something new we did this year, uh, given the state of the economy, uh, is before we did much in the terms of budget development, we had two of our financial advisors, Meter, uh, uh, Meter Patterson Group and Estrada Hinojosa, uh, give us an overview for the economy here in Corpus Christi in Texas. Uh, we wanted to get that to see where our revenue assumptions sound and should we invest more in the community or should we hold back. Uh, but what both financial advisors told us is that uh, Corpus Christi can expect moderate growth over the next 12 months. So that was good news uh, for us. Uh, they said that the manufacturing activity that we have here and, and that we have greater presence of uh, will, will increase, but demand will slow a little bit. They said gas and oil ex, uh, expansion outlook will improve slightly. They said our travel sector is still enjoying that pent-up demand from the COVID epidemic or pandemic, and that service sector employment and capital expenditure index remains positive. So they gave us a good, good outlook for the city of Corpus Christi. We know that in, in um, downturns in the economy before, because of our diverse economy, uh, we've weathered those pretty well. And their projection is that we'll do the same with this one. So with that, we developed the budget. And this is a high-level summary slide. This is a record-setting budget for the city. $1.4 billion is the budget as proposed today. Uh, to the right are some of the uh, separate funds uh, that we put uh, the revenues and expenditures in. And so the general fund, less transfers, is $279 million. Our enterprise funds total $255 million. Those enterprise funds include water, wastewater, airport. 
Our special revenue funds, 155 million, that includes uh, street funds, our crime control district funds, and the type A and type B, those are some examples. And then our debt service funds, uh, where we pay for our geo bond programs and other debt. And then our capital budget is 558 million. So let's look a little closer at the general fund for these next couple of uh, uh, points here. So in the current year, our budget that city council approved about a year ago was 299.3 million, just under 300. This year, we have a record setting 331.5 million. So that's a 10% increase in our budget, commensurate with the revenue growth and the need of more service in the community. And we'll go into detail on that here momentarily. So this graph here shows us our general fund, both in terms of revenues and that outer ring and black, uh, the outer black circle ring. And then the expenditures are in the inner ring. This is a good comprehensive look of revenues and expenditures for our general fund. If you start at the nine o'clock position in that black, you can see sales tax is about 21% of all our revenue. Moving to about the noon, one o'clock time slot or position there, property tax accounts for 30%. And then as we continue along that wheel, our services and fines and fees, services include solid waste services, monthly fee, uh, that's about 34%. So those three revenue sources comprise 85% of all of our revenues. And then the inner circle, uh, you can see with each slice, the expenditure, and so how much we allocate to each of the areas. And we see that police and fire is our biggest uh, investment uh, annually. Public safety totals 46% uh, combined police and fire. You can see solid waste, streets, parks, uh, also take a significant part of the budget. Let's look a little bit at, uh, here at the revenues in the general fund. And so we want to compare the growth in revenues to this year's budget, 2022, to what we're projecting for 2023. And um, what we see is property tax, we're expecting to, in the revenue side, have 6.4% growth, or 6 million. And sales tax, about 9% growth, budget over budget, or about 5.8 million. And then all other revenue growth is about 11 million. So in total, those recurring revenues, what we deem as recurring, we expect to, to achieve 22 million more in revenue recurring in this upcoming budget. In the budget that I'm gonna to present to you to this morning, we're also using one-time resources, uh, over 22 million, uh, that we uh, have achieved through better ending balances in 2021 and better ending balances in 2022. Uh, so for a two-year rollover, we consider these one-time revenues. We don't associate recurring expenditures with them because it's a one-time in nature, and we don't want to hire somebody only to find out we can't afford to pay them in year two. So the budget has a combination of recurring revenue, about $22 million, uh, increase over the current year, and then one-time revenues, similarly, about $22 million. We know there's been a lot of interest in property values and Here's a chart that helps explain it as best we can today. The truth and taxation calculations are still being finalized uh, by the appraisal district and the tax assessor collector. We just got our certified role uh, over the weekend and there's a complicated state formula that has to be used to determine are we collecting more property tax revenue on the, on the base values uh, compared to the prior year. The state law now says you can't collect 3.5% more. Uh, you can only collect 3.5% year over year based on the base values. Based on our using last year's model, a look and as best we can, uh, we've met with Chief uh, Appraiser Ronnie Canales. I personally met with him recently and the team did. It looks like we may be within that 3.5%, uh, but we won't, we won't know for certain until the, uh, the tax appraiser uh, runs all the numbers with us through their models. So today we're saying we think we're, we're in good standing, uh, but as we progress with time and run those models, we'll, we'll update the council along the way. You can see also on that chart, Camille, is uh, so in 2023, if you look to the far right, 13% growth, which is tremendous for our community. Uh, that's real value added on our appraisal uh, roles, our certified value role. Uh, of that growth, uh, 1.83 is from new development, new construction and then 11% or so is from reappraisals. So we're thinking that we can keep the tax rate the same at 64 six cents per $100 evaluation. So in our revenue mix also, and I just wanna point out before we get into the delivery plan, the expenditures, is that our financial reserves remain strong. 
the city council has a financial goal of 20% of all our expenditures we hold in reserves. So 20% would equal 61 million. Today though, uh, even with some of these service improvements, we will have 25% in financial reserves or uh, just under 67, uh, $77 million. And I do want to point out that recently when we issued our, our new GO bonds for the bond program, our three financial advisors still put us in a very high quality bond rating uh, of double A's and a double A2. And what that means is that when we borrow money to do big street projects and capital investment, uh, we get a much better interest rate than if we had uh, a lesser quality. And then just one final update before we get into the expenditures is our stimulus award that we received back in June of 2021. We're making good on, on putting that into production. The city council approved five infrastructure categories of where we would invest that 67 million. In the first tranche of money, about 31 million was received in June of 2021. And we're 86% of that money is either spent or committed and the rest will be committed by the end of this fiscal year. So that money was invested in water lines and wastewater infrastructure, stormwater, North Beach, and fire station number three replacement. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the fun stuff. So uh, I'm gonna go uh, through each of the service areas and talk about changes that are being recommended uh, in this budget. And let's begin with police. So Mayor Wajardo recently challenged uh, me as we developed this budget to see how could we add 25 additional police officer positions. We know the plan was to add between five and 10, uh, but with that challenge, uh, we met, we're meeting that challenge today and presenting it to you, the full city council. This budget includes 25 more police officer positions. And this is a record, this we look back, it's been decades uh, before uh, in the past since this level of new officers had been added. So this is a, an unprecedented uh, recommendation today. It'll bring our total police uh, officer count to 491 police officers, which is the highest that we have ever had in this city. To accommodate that, we'll have two police academies, one in July of next year, and then the second would be in October. We'll begin working, the chief will begin working next summer to get that October class uh, uh, scheduled. So they'll be interviewing and, and putting people through pre-training. And so the class officially starts in October, but a lot of the work will begin in the summer. This budget also converts to help the chief and his leadership team, uh, one of the police officer positions to a police captain, and also provides additional funding for overtime. Uh, the chief has expressed an interest, and we, and we know we need to do it, to improve his equipment inventory. Uh, Mayor Wajardo, uh, four years ago, ha has been advocating for a SWAT vehicle. It's called the Bearcat Armored Vehicle, and she's been advocating for that. So we were able to put it into this year's budget, finally, about $400,000. There's some additional equipment, additional unmarked vehicles, and equipment to help the crime, crime scene unit in the police department. We just want to highlight that uh, in the budget is that money that was in the current year budget, 21.1 million for the new police training academy. And the update on that is that the bids were issued for this academy's construction. It's fully designed by Turner Ramirez Architects, which is uh, pretty unprecedented. The bond program was approved less than two years ago. It's fully designed. It's out for bid and the bids will come in on August 10th, so a little over two weeks. It's a low bid uh, proposal, uh, so, the, uh, so we're hoping the bids will be uh, within that budget. Uh, the architect thinks they will be, given what he hears to be vast interest in companies out there that want to build that for us. So just to go over how do we fund these 25 officers, we know there's been some a question about this in the past, and in the past couple of weeks, if, if we were able to do it. So of the 25, 15 will be funded from the Crime Control District. That's a sales tax funded special district here in our city. And then 10 will be funded from the general fund. Uh, we did 10 this year in the general fund, so we can easily do 10 again this year. The way we're gonna fund the 15 and the crime control is through the fund balance initially. So there's 5.2 million sitting in fund balance in the crime control fund. And that would be spent down over a three year period to help fund these officers, the additional 15. And then beginning in year three, we'll begin to transition them to the general fund in a slower way over a two, three year period. That $1 million will last us for about five years, but year three into that continuum, we'll begin to transition them to the general fund, those 15 that we added. Okay, so we know that we have two sides to public safety and the other one is fire. 
and uh, Chief Rocha uh, recommended uh, a couple of initiatives that we're able to fund here. One uh, for those veteran council members has been something that uh, Council Member Smith and Hunter and even the mayor have been advocating for, which is getting more of our what we call companies, our fire trucks when they go out, whether it's a pumper or a ladder, getting more of them to have four firefighters on each one of those vehicles. Today, the majority have three firefighters that go out uh, when a vehicle leaves, when a, when a ladder or pumper truck leaves. Uh, the National Fire Protection Association staffing standards, the best practice basically, uh, recommends four firefighters on every company that leaves to a scene. And so this budget adds 18, or 16, I'm sorry, 16 firefighters to, mo to move more companies, four more in fact, to four person staffing. So we have 22 companies uh, today, only four are four person staffed. This will move another four, so we'll have a total of eight that'll be four person staffed. And this is a five-year plan that Chief uh, and we in this budget are initiating. So over the next four years, we'll att attempt in the budget to get all 22 companies four-person staffed. It's also something that every major Texas city's fire departments have already, and we're, uh, we're trying to get there. So this will be uh, step one in that process of a five-year plan. And then we're also adding eight additional firefighters to add another medic unit. And this year, it will be in station number 12 in the Cal Allen, Annabelle, Tuloso, Midway area. We know in the current year budget, we added one in City Council District 5 at, the, at Yorktown at 17, Fire Station 17. We also knew last summer that we needed one in station 12, and we said if we add another one this year, that's where it will go. It's based on call volume. And so in that Cal Allen area, we'll have at station 12 an, another medic unit. We do have academy classes scheduled uh, in this budget. So there'll be, there's attrition in the fire department just like in the police department. And so uh, we fully funded a, a, a class. And I did want to recognize Chief Rocha that the first time in decades, every one of his positions is filled. Right, Chief? That's the first time I think in decades he told me that's from funding these academies and having an aggressive, he had the highest number of fire cadets in, in one of his most recent academies. So. That's great news and, and uh, we're, we're proud of it. In the equipment area, you can see several things here, including an alert system for firefighters in the station to alert them to the, to, to the call for service. And one I like the most is two replacement ladder trucks at 2.8 million. Uh, the two that these brand new ones were replaced are aged and past their lifetime. Now in this budget, uh, you can see to the left, I think maybe the first time you're seeing this, but this is a rendition of fire station number three that was in the 2018 bond, pro, uh, 2020, I'm sorry, bond program. And also we added some of that stimulus money to what we thought fully funded. However, at 60% design, our architect firm, BRW, is suggesting that the cost per square foot because of inflation, supply chain and labor issues is gonna be more like 550 a square foot instead of 350. So we have an earmark of 2.5 million of set aside in the event that bids do come in higher. So this station is fully funded with these additional 2.5 million that's in this budget. And then Councilman Pusley recently talked about, we have to finally get another ELC building going. And we know the council has talked about that. Today we're in a, in a third floor of a building that's only rated for a category three hurricane, which is not gonna help us if we have a five. So we're putting a 100,000 recommendation in this budget to study this, this uh, new ELC. Where could we put it? Who would be in there? Would it be just the city? Would it be the city county? Would it be other counties? How much space do we need? And so we have to get serious about this. So $100,000 to begin that process once and for all about building a new ELC center. We're gonna to move to what is in our communities their most important uh, uh, initiative, which is our streets. I really do like this chart that we put together because it shows continuing increases in streets. This year we have a 12% increase over the current year budget. And that top gray box is the one that most of our community is focused on, which is our residential streets. So that increases to 24 million from the current 18 million. There's 15 million more dollars or a 12% increase for a total of 136 million in this year's budget. This chart here shows pretty much the same thing, uh, but the key takeaway here is that bottom note, which is that in three years, we will have budgeted 336 million for streets. It does show a 12% increase in streets in FY23 and a $336 million total over three years, including this budget. 
So this chart here will be further explained when we have one of our work sessions, but I put it up just to demonstrate that we have a pretty complex funding mechanism to do our streets over time. The council and council policies have dedicated and pledged certain revenues uh, to make sure our streets are done. And so on the far left circles, you can see in the gold, the industrial district. And then again, on the far right, there's another gold. So 10% of our industrial district revenue, uh, the payment in lieu of taxes go to streets. That's a council policy. Uh, we have the street maintenance fee that was approved by council some time ago that generates about $12 million that goes to streets. We have our two plus two property tax increase that the voters approved that leverage, le leverages about $9 million. So in total, uh, there are over 10 different or 10 different funding sources that we have dedicated to streets in our community. In our streets area, this budget includes some additional improvements, uh, most notably in our right-of-way area. And so this is an area where we want to protect the street. We don't want a utility coming in and cutting the street and doing substandard repair work. Today, for the entire network of streets we have, we have one person to manage that whole thing. And so this budget recommends four additional positions and incremental fee adjustments as well to pay for them. Uh, we really need to be like other big Texas cities and have a robust uh, right-of-way management program. This budget begins that. There's also a cost-saving measure to bring in-house a engineering crew. Uh, today we use outside consultants to survey and, and engineer things like uh, curbs and sidewalks when we do them in-house. Uh, by bringing that function in-house with a team of four, we're able to not only do the work, but save over $466,000 a year. So that's a, a real good initiative. We know that Vision Zero is important for the council and it's been championed by Councilman Molina uh, for many years. This budget has even more uh, for Vision Zero than we've had in the past. Uh, with a match, a leverage match from MPO, we're able to do five pedestrian mobility and safety projects. Uh, the city's contribution will be 2.7, MPO's contribution 3.5 for a total of 6.3 million for five uh, very robust uh, pedestrian safety projects across the city. There's a median uh, treatment of 365,000 City Council District 3 to help the new Mary Carroll High School. Uh, we have a program to put all of our traffic signals on battery backup. And so today if there's a power outage, they go out. Uh, this system would allow them to stay on on battery backup. And then finally, we have a new high-intensity activated crosswalk, also known as Hawk, in City Council District 2. Councilman Molina and I have been working on this, this uh, mid-block crossing where there's a new Walmart heavily frequented, uh, but a little bit of a preca precarious uh, transport across the street for pedestrians. So we're going to put the best system in, which is the Hawk system, with this budget. Now this chart here I really like, and I think Councilman uh, Hernandez and others will as well. We know that we just improved Ocean Drive from I-37 to Ennis Jocelyn, and it looks great. Uh, the community tells us we know it. Uh, what we want to do is keep it looking like that every year in the future. And so this is a 10-year plan to keep maintaining Ocean Drive so it looks pretty much, if not exactly, how it looks today and rides as smooth. And so over the 10-year plan, there's some minor treatment that is done, crack sealants, uh, improvements to some of the flat work, as we call it. But by year five, we're saying we probably are going to need a thin overlay, uh, what we call an ultra-thin uh, ultra asphalt application. Uh, that's budgeted. These dollars are not available, but it's in our 10-year capital improvement plan. And so we're saying, except for year one, we do have that budgeted. What we're saying is we need to take this seriously and make sure, as Councilman Smith has said, that we maintain what is known as the best roadway in Texas, right? And so we can see that by year 10, our engineers are telling us we're probably going to need some type of a mill and overlay. It may not be as deep as what we did this last time, uh, but in year 10, we would mill and overlay the entire stretch again of $20 million. One other thing we put in here is a 10-year plan of $100,000 a year for 10 years or $1 million to begin to take those medians that are there from uh, Louisiana all the way to Ennis Jocelyn a little more seriously. There's a total of 94 medians and the, it's a hodgepodge of landscaping and other stuff. And so we have 100,000 in this budget and we're recommending 100 for nine more years, 100,000. So that over the 10 years, those medians will be redone, reimagined, starting with this year with a master plan to see how we can treat each one of them. We're not talking about extensive landscaping, uh, just something to make them look better than what they look today. Uh, they really add to the overall view when you drive down, and they should look better. Uh, we also have a $1.2 million allocation for a traffic intersection and traffic signal at Ocean Drive and, and uh, Airline uh, to complement that new apartment building that is nearing completion, the Alexa. 
uh, that what we have there is very outdated and, and doesn't complement the, the area well. <clears throat> we know that downtown is, an, is important to us. And recently, the downtown management district has been working on reimagining Water Street uh, to make it less of a wide corridor, more of a pedestrian mall. And so in this budget, to, con to help in that effort, uh, we have $8 million in water and wastewater imp improvements <clears throat> for that stretch of roadway, uh, $6.4 million for water pipe replacement, and one point six for wastewater improvements. That's below surface of the very aged and dated. And then we think that the Tourist 3 would be a good place to consider some funding for things like uh, resurfacing, uh, landscaping, and amenities. And that's $6.4 million for the water project. There is some money already for street work, and so there'll be water in some streets as well. Now, we know recently City Council approved and was very excited to do uh, a light-up CC program. We're still um, using those yellow, orange, uh, what we call high-pressure sodium bulbs, which gives you the view that you see in the left of that graphic, which is somewhat dated and not too efficient because you really still can't see too well at night, and, and our, our longer uh, nights are coming here soon. And so in this budget, we had 300000 to begin what is a two- or three-year initiative. Within this budget, we're fully funding the entire project now. So we add $2.1 million <clears throat> in this budget to fully, the, fully cover the cost of replacing all 15,000 light bulbs to these high-efficient uh, LED lights that last longer. And for us, as taxpayers, the cheaper to operate. We pay the utility bill for all of our street lights in our neighborhoods. And when everything is said and done, we'll save about 675000 a year in that utility bill because the LED light bulbs are much cheaper to run. Now, this is something very important to our city. We know that a lot of people, including us, travel in and out of our city. And yet, we're probably one of the only big cities in Texas that does not have monument signage that says, you're in Corpus Christi. And we're going to change that with this budget. We've tried with the Type A, Type B boards with no success. So in this budget, I'm recommending $2.3 million for two gateway signage, signage treatments as you come into the city. That's both at 37 coming south. And then when you enter North Beach at 181, we'll have a monument sign there. Something similar to the one we see here. This is one version of a, of a rendition uh, recently submitted to us. And then also at Labonte Park, where we're putting tremendous investment at Councilman Lerma and Pusley's urging, uh, we'll have a similar sign uh, that complements the city gateway sign uh, that says Labonte Park. So $2.3 million uh, for those gateway signage treatments. Now, this slide has a lot of detail. It's a mix of streets still and, and economic development. And so let me go through it. So we know that in City Council District 5, I do especially, Councilman Hernandez has driven me through an industrial park that is in District 5. It's the only one there. And uh, it was a form of mili military installation. On the top picture, you can see it's just to the side of our Bill Witt Park, and you can access it off Yorktown. Uh, when the city, when the military kind of sold this off, I think in the 50s or 60s, the city acquired some of the streets and then private landowners acquired some of them as well. We know they're probably one of, if not the worst streets in the city, and there's some great economic uh, development activity happening there. There's some boat shops, some uh, high, there's pretty high-end businesses, and so this budget pledges the uh, Type B sales tax money that's available for streets, $4.3 million, to rehab Doberman, uh, Pyrenees and Bay Drive, and then it has $100,000 to do title work and work with the property owners that own those other streets to see would they be willing to let the city acquire that land, and then in the future we can rehab those streets as well. So this nice industrial park and one of our highest growth corridors in the city will have good infrastructure. Today, it's, you, you don't really want to see it. Now, uh, Councilman Lerma and I recently traveled his district. We spent the whole morning together, and what we recognize, and he knew it already, as well as uh, Councilman Pusley, is that Leopard Street needs some attention. This is an old corridor in and out of the city before 37 existed. We looked particularly at Lantana to Toloso uh, because the, sh the street is not in all that great shape. Councilman Lerma, to repave that ins entire section, uh, which is about five miles, would be $100 million. So it's very pricey. So what we want to do in this budget is we've allocated $500,000 to do an engineering assessment and strategic plan for how do, we, how do we tackle this? Do we have to replace all the utilities? Do we still need two lanes in each direction with a, a, a divided median, a landscape median? And so that'll help us begin to study this and put it on our books to address. 
we can't not address it. It's five miles of an important roadway. There's a lot of uh, industrial support systems there, small businesses and neighborhoods. And so that $5 million will finally set a plan in motion uh, to where we can finally address this through future bond programs piece by piece. And then also we recognize that even on Leopard Street, there's still some great small businesses. Uh, many cities have, and we have it in our downtown area, what we call a business facade match program. And so this budget includes 250,000 as a leverage match. So as a business wants to improve how their business looks in the front, uh, we'll give them some dollars if they bring some to the table as well. Uh, so that'll help rejuvenate some of those businesses. And we know that our industrial development agreements uh, that we have with many of our industrial partners here in the city expire in 2024. We have an internal city team that we already kind of know who is gonna be on that team, but I wanna bring some experts in from either Texas or across the country to help us uh, to make sure we're getting the best value for us, the city, but we're also being fair to the industry. And so we have $200,000 to bring in consultants to help us when we renegotiate those contracts. We know that under the leadership of Robert Dodd, finally our Parks and Recreation Department, at least in the three years I've been here, will, uh, is beginning to take shape. Uh, uh, Robert Dodd and his team are focused on some of the key things in the parks. We know there's a, a wide array of what things that we have to address, but we're focused on a few. So in this budget, more amenities for some of our park system, better park maintenance, and better beaches. That's the theme that Robert Dodd recommended. So in more amenities, we have $2 million to, to provide certain amenities in all of our parks and all five city council districts a shade structure treatment for the Cole Park Plaza, which has uh, turned out just to be too hot without any shade structure. There's some on the periphery, but not enough. A new dog park in Flower Bluff. We know Councilman Smith has been uh, interested in that as well as the mayor. And then funding for lighting at Swantner Park. That's one of our chain of parks along the Bayfront. Councilman Molina and I recently talked about it. The parking lot could use some additional lighting to make sure it's safe at all times. So 250 for that. And park maintenance, this is an important initiative the mayor has been talking about and many of the council members that frequent downtown. Uh, we want to put more attention on the Bayfront, the Bay Bayfront parks, five dedicated staff persons, Councilman Lerma, especially focused on Selena, uh, the Selena Marador and Shrine, really. That'll improve cleanliness, improve customer service uh, and security in those areas. Funding for a separate contract to do our athletic fields mowing today, as uh, Robert Dodd told me, they take crews off for mowing the parks and bring them to the ball fields. It's not a good mix because both sides aren't really getting uh, good maintenance. And so this would add a dedicated crew just for our athletic fields, and we have a lot in our city. We have maintenance. Th this One of the things we're doing in our budgets is when we build something, we put dollars in for maintenance. Councilman Hernandez has talked about this a lot. So three new things that are coming online that were included in this year's budget and in prior funding budgets is a West Guth and a Sherwood and District 2 dog park. So 66000 is included in this budget for better maintenance of those new facilities so we can keep them looking good. The same thing on, in City Council District 4, the North Padre Island Beach Storage Facility. We want to make sure that looks nice all, at all times, so $100,000 to improve the maintenance there. On our beaches, we have positions to expand cleaning on the beaches as well as more lifeguards on our, on our Gulf beaches, as well as reaching out to those younger future employees of ours who would be lifeguards with a life skills course or skills uh, training course, I should say, on, on how to be a lifeguard, what does it mean to be a lifeguard, as well as an education campaign going into the schools and talking to children about safety on the beach. Now we know that North Beach is one of our oldest beaches, and so we want to have a, a separate uh, slide here. I'm not sure if Carrie, I think she's gone, but we have tremendous investment with Councilman Lerma's leadership in North Beach, and so this budget continues that by adding four lifeguards for the first time in decades back at, at North Beach in those summer months from uh, Labor to Memor uh, Memorial to Labor Day. So four lifeguards for the summer season. $100,000 incentive program for merchants, similar to what we have on McGee Beach. We have the nice umbrella service by a local vendor. That's really well utilized. The beach looks great when you see the umbrellas and cabanas out there. So an incentive program to get something similar on North Beach. This would help incentivize a business to come over there uh, on North Beach during those summer months. We have 835000 Councilman Lerma and, and Pusley, in the budget for the historical Plaza Shade. We know we were there not too long ago with a nice ribbon cutting. We want some shade so people can really stay there for a while and look at those nice interpretive signs. 
And then in our, uh, in our North Beach uh, restroom project, we heard uh, one of our speakers here momentarily or a few minutes ago talk about it. The North Beach restroom is another one of those projects that's coming in based on early estimates a little above budget. So we have 2.2 in the budget for construction. Uh, this project has a little bit of additional amenities that were added more than what we thought when we did the bond program and some inflationary issues. So 2.5 million more to make sure we do this right. So this is gonna be a brand new restroom. You can see it in the picture there. We're moving that dated one that's blocking the beach and the view and it's really not the safest because you have to walk around the beach to use it. It has a brand new parking lot and a brand new playground with real nice play equipment, barbecue benches and so on. This is gonna be a premier location. Everything will be elevated so it won't flood when we have rains or, or groundwater seepage. And then finally, $100,000 uh, is in the budget, as our speakers have mentioned, for the North Beach Eco Park that Councilman Pusley recently talked about. We know there's some initial design plans. $100,000 will advance them and help us on the right path of how exactly we're going to do it. I know Carrie Myers and others on North Beach have been asking for this, and so it's in the, in the bond program. Now, uh, one of the funds that we do have is what is called our SHOT Fund, our State Hotel Occupancy Tax Fund. And that fund has, has generated a pretty significant fund balance in, in the years prior to me being here and even while I have been here. And so I challenge the staff to let's put that money in production. We have money set aside over a five-year time frame for beach renourishment. That's one of the main things we use it for. Uh, but the staff has come up with a plan to put a brand new restroom facility, not porta potties or skitter cans, but a brand new permanent facility right on our Gulf Beach at Zahn Road adjacent uh, the Packery Channel. It'll be a, a brand new restroom facilities, uh, male, female restrooms, uh, and then also some storage room for our equipment that we use on the beach, as well as rest, uh, lo locker rooms and an area for our lifeguards, which today they don't have any. So uh, that's a great initiative there on the Gulf Beach. Economic development is very important to the city council. Uh, we know that, we talk about it every week. Uh, only in the 80s, I think, did we have something about maybe an economic development department here or some semblance of one, some of the former staff told me. Uh, but this and this budget finally places an economic development department with two additional positions and moving four from various departments under one unit uh, with a director and additional staff to focus on economic development above and beyond what our well-respected uh, EDC does and well-utilized. And so the budget adds additional positions to, to add to the four that we have today to create an economic development department. Uh, that department will work real closely with the mayor's office who often is the first call uh, small businesses make or new businesses make when they come into the city. We will continue our support for the Economic Development Corporation, the 700,000 uh, level funding in this budget uh, for that agency that we have many of us that are on that board. And then our downtown management district continues full funding at just under a million dollars uh, for the services they do. We want to point out our health department. We know that this city council did a monumental uh, and legacy changing uh, event this year by bringing that entire system into our, our purview rather than having two entities manage it. Uh, we made some adjustments in it in this budget, adding two additional environmental public health inspectors. So those, those are the ones that go into the restaurants uh, to do inspections as well as any new septic tanks or pools. And then we also have a public health technician, which is new. This position will monitor the over 100 communicable diseases that are out there, uh, including COVID. And so they'll continue to work with the team on things like surveillance, treatment, and, and intervention. And then just to put on the radar here, make sure people know air quality is important to this council. And we do have one position in our organization uh, that has moved from uh, planning to public works, and now we're gonna move it into health. Uh, we think that's the right place for it after we've looked at several health districts across the state and country. So that position will move into the health and we're retitling it. We also have um, in this budget and the CIP uh, and the council has approved and have seen some of this already. We have uh, phase one of what will be a three phase rehabilitation of our health facility, health district facility. You can see the picture of it here, it's on Horn Road. It was built in the late seventies and when you walk in there, it's like walking back into the late 70s because nothing's been, nothing's been changed. Uh, some minor adjustments here and there. So this is a complete uh, reimagining of the inside. We had one of our professional firms, engineering firms, assess the building to see. I asked them that. I said, is this building salvageable? Do we demolish it and build new or do we try to rehab it? They said it's a real structurally sound building. You're better off financially 
uh, re rehabilitating it. And so that's what this will do, phase one, 5.4 million. It's both a customer service center, that's where folks go for service, but our employees now all go there as well. So we wanna make sure it's, it's, a, it's a, what's that, Councilman? Right, landscape. There has to be some treatment around the grading. There's actually water going when it does rain the other way towards the building, causing some issues. So uh, all that will be fixed in this three-phase uh, approach. Vital statistics is part of the health uh, model uh, redo where we brought it under the city's purview exclusively. Uh, we did move vital records uh, with the city secretary's uh, uh, willingness to do it to the city secretary, which is pretty common across Texas. Uh, we're recommending two additional vital clerks to be added to the three that we have today. So that'll give us five persons here at City Hall uh, to issue birth and death certificates. And so this is a good part of that restructure and a good addition as well. We know libraries is important. And this picture to my left is the first that you'll see of the rendition of the reimagined library. We know that in our 2022 bond program, there's 2.5 million to improve the entire envelope, the exterior of the library. You can see how nice it'll look here with a different treatment. There's some, uh, some highlighting of those arches uh, with either tile or different painting and a whole brand new landscape program for the front. That's in the budget. Additional things we're adding is one librarian position uh, to improve patron um, and additional library computers for the patrons. In our branch libraries today, we don't have coverage all the time with security, it's, it's intermittent. And so the budget recommends 110,000 to make sure when every branch library is open, the security service, the entire opening of that branch. We have money for capital repairs uh, consistently each year. We put a little bit in to help uh, keep those libraries looking good, 250,000. And then the library director has expressed concern that we use our La Retama library as a cooling center and sometimes as a, an additional center under catastrophic emergency type events, but there's no generator there. There's no backup generator. So the budget recommends $500,000 for a new generator. And then finally, I asked Laura uh, Garcia, a library director, Laura, what if long term, what do we need in our system? You know, let's begin planning now. And she said, you know, the, the branch libraries we have are great. The one in District 5 is good, but it's a partnership with the school district and with security on campuses, new security protocol, that library is becoming more and more difficult to access by our patrons. It's also a little smaller. It's right on the campus of Caffey Middle School. And so we have 100,000 in the budget to begin that, that conversation or that analysis of where, do we, where can we build a standalone District 5, the fastest growing area in our city, a new branch library. So 100,000 will help us do some site assessment and other programming. Now we know animal care is very important to many on the council and uh, Councilman Molina is uh, particularly interested in it and the mayor uh, is as well. And uh, this Friday, the mayor is gonna have a press event. She'll be inviting the council to an initiative she's been working with, with South Texas Animal Rescue, also known as STAR. And it is a spay, neuter, mobile van service or mobile clinic service. Uh, in our budget, we have $30,000 for that partnership. We're recommending in this budget 500,000 additional dollars to maybe expand that particular uh, venue with STAR or to see if there's another one that will work because the goal in our animal care area is to reduce uh, the pet population, the stray pet population. And we know that spay neuter is step one in doing that. And so we have 500,000 recommended in this budget for additional spay neuter services, more positions at the, at the actual animal care facility, including more kennel attendants, as well as uh, additional veterinarian assistance. By adding one more veterinarian assistant and converting a temp, we'll have two teams of veterinarians, a veterinarian and an assistant, and, and that'll be times two. Municipal Court, we wanna thank new, uh, we wanna thank the new leadership, or we wanna thank, I should say, the Honorable Presiding Judge Jackie Chopper for new leadership in Municipal Court. We still have some work to do there. In this budget, we're recommending a municipal courts review at 50,000, looking at the business processes more on the administrative side, not the judicial side, to see things like how do we communicate with the customers, the throughput time, our collection rates. So 50,000 to help that study. And to address some of the customer service concerns, we're recommending two court clerks, as well as on the magistration side, increasing part-time judges, judges hours uh, that budget so they can do more magistration on evenings and weekends and holidays. 
communications is an important part of our business here in the city, making sure our community knows what we're doing and they have a, a good sense for what we're doing. We know many council members and the mayor were at our unveiling of our new 311 number and call center. Uh, this money, uh, this budget adds some additional dollars for overtime to make sure we have good representation at the call center. There's also funding to train our communications teams and our communications department. We have 311, but communications people that help with the media, media releases and so on. And they've said we want more dollars for training, make sure we're up to speed on how we do things and write and so on. And then some advertising dollars as well so that we can get uh, good awareness out in our community when we uh, have a, a major event. Councilman Hernandez chairs our audit committee and uh, we've uh, been working on that budget uh, and making good on the promise that in the current year we added one position and an intern and we said that in this year's budget we look at adding that second auditor position that was recommended by the auditor and so this budget adds one staff auditor bringing their total complement in that department to six at uh, 71,000 for this year. So that was a general fund. We're just gonna go through some of these other funds real quick. Our hut revenues, hotel occupancy tax. We're seeing good growth there. 6.7% is the projected growth in hut revenues for 2023. Our visitors uh, center or our visit Corpus Christi, 5.9 million is allocated in the budget for their service that they provide us. We have 3.3 million as the beginning of a big investment that we have to make at our convention center. And then we continue funding for the art museum, the science of uh, the Museum of Science and History, the Botanical Gardens, and the Texas State Aquarium. Those four entities receive 1.3 from our hut tax for either advertising or keeping uh, some of their business operations open to the visitors. And uh, we just want to highlight that another huge monumental change this council has done is brought in a new managing partner for our American Bank Center. And so OVG 360, our new managing partner, began on July 1. And we're already seeing some great improvements uh, with venues there at the American Bank Center. The Mayor's State of the City address is the 4th of August, Mayor, right? August 4th? August 4th. Uh, August 4th. And there we're going to see how well their food is, Councilman Pusley. So we met with the You're not going to be yes. disappointed. It's we're not going to be. We delicious. had a taste testing already. <laughs> They're is. real excited about showing us that new food. I know. They have the new there. group has not only a manager over the building, but they have a manager over hospitality and food service. On top of that, a, a chef uh, that uh, is is outstanding. So, Mayor, we're looking forward to that yes, uh, state you. of the state of the city address, but the meal too. Right? Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah. what is that? I didn't hear you. And, uh, I was saying we're looking forward to your remarks, but also the meal. Oh right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, remarks great. first. <laughs> <the meal. laughs> Oh no, you should be, wait, y'all are gonna be so surprised. Yeah. The, the and I say that because I did a, a tasting and it was, yeah. I was envisioning your face the whole time. <laughs> yes. And it was gonna be so delicious. They were doing an amazing job. Yes, they do. So staying in our, our focus area of, of, tra of uh, uh, visitors and, and, and the destination, airport does have uh, nearly $7 million. Uh, a lot of this you've seen already, but we just wanna highlight it. There's money in the budget for, for a new outdoor concourse patio. When the weather cools a little bit, it'd be great to just step outside the concourse area there while they wait for flights. There's a new roof replacement and window glazing at the terminal, 2.5 million. And then improvements to restrooms, a nursing room, as well as an animal relief area. All improvements made at 3.6 million. So we wanna thank Kevin and his team for improving our facility and they're still working on uh, flights, uh, more direct flights and, and better pricing as well. Development services is another one of our business areas and we wanna thank Al and, and Michael Dice and Nina for their leadership. I recently met with the developers. They meet every, every month and they made it a point. I went up just to say hi to them, but they said, Peter, this department is killing it. They said they love the changes they see. They had no complaints. They said, as long as they keep doing what they're doing, we're happy. And uh, the department shared this budget with them last Friday. And I don't think anybody, Councilman Barrow, did you get any calls from Wendy? No, okay, then it must be all right. I know they have some concern, obviously, about the fee adjustments. They agreed to a four-year um, slight adjustment each year, and so the budget does continue that, uh, some slight adjustments in the fees as prior approved uh, to uh, make sure we get the revenue to provide them the service so that their turnaround time is quick. You can see a number of things here that are on this slide. There's 14 positions added in total uh, what this will do is increase performance and plan review and increase turnaround time and field inspections. And that's all very important uh, to the development community. So some good improvements there. 
The next two are water and wastewater, and these, the story on both of these is continued investment, both on personnel and in infrastructure, to reverse decades of neglect, and we're continuing to do that. We have uh, positions to improve our valve construction and preventive maintenance team uh, work, uh, a coordinator to uh, help on purchasing and inventory, uh, more persons at our, what we call utility business office. This is where somebody who calls on an issue about their water bill, in the past, the 311 now rep would handle that, but they don't always have the best information right from the business. So we also have a utility business office. So the business has been reassessed and, and calls now will be shifted more towards UBO that deal with one's water bill, leaving those 311 call takers to deal with other business mm -hmm. and making sure the UBO who are best qualified to answer those questions are actually getting those calls. Uh, but we've known for some time that we need to add a few more, so we're converting uh, temporary positions to full-time uh, to increase the number of people that can help customers when they call. Tremendous investment still at our own Stevens Water Treatment Plant. There's 195 million programmed over the next three years to continue the investment there, and 148 million over the next three years in our water line replacement, with 50 million in this year's budget alone. Three years ago, that number would have dropped to zero. It would have been five million. We need to be at 50 million for the next several years in water line replacement, and so this budget makes good on continuing that. In wastewater, we know we have six wastewater treatment plants. There's 28 positions recommended to improve all aspects of that business to continue. We know the consent decree, many of these are in that plan already, and so this is keeping in line with that federal government agreement that we had have that over 15 years we improve our wastewater system. It's not just about the line replacement, it's about uh, preventative inspections, repairs in a timely manner, lift station maintenance. Uh, we have uh, concrete and restoration work that has to be done when there's a water line break, and then more positions at Laguna Madre and White Cap wastewater treatment plants. All six wastewater treatment plants continue the investment that we started several years ago. There's 157 million uh, in the plan over the next three years, as well as 66 million in the next three years for lift station. We have over 100 lift stations in our city, and so all those need some type of improvement, and the plan is in there to do that. We have a great run gas department. We own that utility here in the city, and Bill Mahaffey does a great job. Just a few additional positions uh, to support the line locate program. So today, when I, anybody, doesn't matter if it's us, a private sector company digs, they call our, a number, and we handle the majority of those line locates, Bill Mahaffey's team does. So we're adding two more positions so that we can take care of even things like telecommunication line locates. Uh, we've had some incidences recently where some of those have been broken on Leopard Street. And so IT will relinquish their job of doing that and let Bill Mahaffey's team do it, who's there anyway. So this is somewhat of an efficiency measure and a safety one at that. Okay, now this next one, Stormwater, uh, we'll have Public Works go over this in much more detail. This looks real busy here, uh, but this is an important one. This is another legacy reversal that this council has addressed, which is for the first time ever, the city has a stormwater program. We didn't have one before. With a dedicated fee that's not only transparent, uh, but that is fair and equitable. And so in the yellow, you can see year two of what is a five-year plan. This shows six years, but we had a five-year plan laid out uh, that said we'd have a slight fee adjustment each of the five years so that we can bring more and more service into the community. Things that the city was not doing, like sweeping streets. We weren't sweeping any streets anywhere uh, three years ago. Today, you can see kind of midway through, we're doing residential, collector, and arterials. And you can see today we're doing residentials only twice a year. Ultimately, we want to be at four times a year in this plan. Collector streets like a Staples or an Everhart, we're sweeping those twice a year, but we want to be 12 times a year, once a month. And they, <clears throat> and they need it. Uh, every time I'm driving down there, I call up and tell the guys, this, we need these things swept again if we can. Arterials like a Lipes or an Oso Parkway or a Whitecap Boulevard, we're doing those eight times a year. We want to do them every month. Uh, ultimately. Wow. This budget focuses on uh, stormwater inlet cleaning. So you, when you drive down the street, you see the inlets uh, where water goes into if they're clogged or if they have debris inside, the system's not going to work well, or all that stuff that's in there is going into our bays and estuaries and creeks. And so the focus this year is that, is, is, is cleaning those inlets once, 1.3 times, uh, 
every year, every 1.3 years. So cleaning every one of them every one year. Today, we clean every one of them every three years. So we get to one, and then we don't get back to it three years from now. So the budget focus this year is clean them once a year, all of our inlets. There's some improvements you can see in the out years for minor, for minor channel and major channel maintenance as well. And so this is a fee plan. This is consistent with what we showed last year. If we just focus for now, and again, we'll go over this in, in much greater detail with the department, the yellow. And if you look at the tier two residential, that's where most of our residential customers fall based on their lot size. So the fee would go up $1.57 a month at $7.69 uh, per month now. We will continue, though, to have this uh, 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 monthly rate uh, program, adjustments, uh, uh, utility assistance program. And so if somebody uh, who qualifies can't afford the $1.57 per month, uh, we'll take care of it for the first year. We have the same program today, and several customers are utilizing that. In our solid waste, the city is the agency that picks up all the trash and recycling for the entire uh, residential community here in Corpus Christi. And we're purchasing some additional carts, as well as adding a staff person or persons uh, to help in our recycling program and the recycling compliance and education program. Uh, that unit's gotten a little bit bigger, uh, rightly so, uh, but we need the right type of oversight and planning, and so that's what is recommended there. In this operation, uh, too, we're recommending a rate increase of $1.15 a month. It's been four years uh, since we've had a rate adjustment, and we know nobody likes rate adjustments, but just the cost of diesel fuel alone is uh, outstripping the revenues that we have for this operation, as well as things like our own recycling carts. Those are made out of petrochemical products, and we're seeing a huge increase in the cart cost as well, not to mention the increase in labor over the past four years. So this is a good chart here that shows all of our rates. Uh, we know that there's no change in our property tax rate, no change in our water or wastewater rate, no change in our gas delivery rate. Uh, we have a pass-through charge, so if gas prices go up, those get passed on to the customer, but the operational cost won't change, the same delivery cost. And then the stormwater has that $1.57 for the typical customer and $1.15 for solid waste as well. Our capital budget, this is a busy slide, and we'll have our engineering uh, director, Jeff Edmonds, go over it in greater detail when he presents. Uh, but a pretty robust capital program, $617 million, the largest in the city's history. You can see our focus is on water, wastewater, streets. As you can see there, stormwater as well. Let's talk a little bit about employee compensation as we close out here. So uh, we know we have over 3,900 employees, and uh, we know that inflation is gripping everybody. And so this budget recommends a 4% cost of living adjustment, a COLA, for all civilian employees. It sidesteps what we've had for the past three years, which is a performance-based system. So we're not going to do that this year. And in lieu of it, there will be a 4% automatic cost of living increase on October 1 for all civilian employees, regardless of, of uh, their position title. Uh, we did check this with uh, what others are doing here in Corpus Christi in the state, and we ran it through our financial advisors when we had that first meeting with them. And they said, yeah, Peter, you have to do this. Uh, the inflation is just eating people's lunch, and we have to get immediate relief uh, to our employees. And so that's why we're recommending this today. Uh, the 4% is pretty much in line with what other entity is doing here in our city, and it's consistent with what other uh, cities are doing in Texas. Uh, we know that the police and fire unions' uh, wage increases are governed by their collective bargaining agreements, and so those go in, in place automatically and are funded. And we just did want to highlight out that we'll begin the new agreements uh, in 23 for police. We'll begin to s the negotiating uh, for theirs. Their four-year contracts coming up, and then fire will begin in 2024. Uh, but again, we have a great working relationship with both union presidents, um, Leeton and Sobs, and we appreciate that working relationship. Uh, many cities don't have that, and we're, we're fortunate here to have it, and uh, we respect it a lot. So uh, two sides of the equation for our employees is uh, pay, but health care is a big part of any employee package. Uh, we get some great news here. The city, uh, because of our change three years ago to a consumer-driven health care plan, uh, meaning the city contributes some dollars to the employee and they have to help us manage their health care costs. Uh, that is a very popular plan that many cities have gone to. The private sector use, has been using it for decades. But um, uh, uh, this, the highlight for the city, for our costs, is that uh, police medical insurance premiums paid by the city are projected to remain flat 
So for all our police officers, uh, they're all on the CDHP plan. No increase on the taxpayer or the city for their plan. On fire, we have some great news. The fire has been migrating away from uh, their, um, their PPO plan to the CDH plan, and we're glad they are because there's a 10% decrease in the PPO cost to the city, a 10% drop. And uh, there's also a 12% drop in the CDH plans when it comes to firefighters, which is saving the city $700,000. And we told uh, the fire union president and we tell the council that that 700,000 in savings, where you're still getting the same or better health care, helps us do things like buy ladder trucks that are 1.2 million, right? So the more we focus on being wise in how we use our taxpayer dollars, overall the better we can run as an organization. And then on the civilian side, we're seeing some increases in that PPO of 11%, and so we're working on that. We want to try to migrate more of our employees to the PPO, I mean the CDHP, I'm sorry, the Consumer Driven Healthcare Plan, because this year we're seeing a 10% decrease in costs there, which is a great move. So this is even better news for the employee who will get that 4% cost of living adjustment, should council approve it. Uh, for the average employee that's on the Consumer Driven Healthcare Plan, they will see a 10% decrease in their payroll deduction. Yes, meaning it's cheaper for us to provide them health care costs for us and them as well. So they're gonna get extra money in their paycheck, a 10% decrease in what they have to pay if they're on the consumer-driven health care plan, which is great. That's for the employee plus family. There's three different plan types to include employee only. And then there is an increase in that more premium plan, the PPO, that's gonna cost employees 11% more if they stay in that plan. Here's the catch though, they have the ability to switch over if they want to, it's up to them, it's their choice. Our human resources department led by Yvonne McHaney have an extensive uh, education program to make sure every employee is fully aware of the differences in the two plans and to help them show that the PPO is a more expensive option for them and the consumer driven healthcare plan is, is a much better off, offer for them. So employees can see if they make the right healthcare choice, an increase in pay and a decrease in healthcare costs in a, in a time like this with high inflation, uh, that's really uh, pretty commendable. There's no change to the fire or the, or the police is uh, payroll deductions for health care. And then sticking with the employee theme here, uh, in this budget a lot of directors uh, talk to me about, you know what, we, we know we have issues on labor and, and uh, it's not always about the hiring process, but rather about how do we train and retain them. And so several departments uh, recommended and we approved to present to the council programs that will help keep employees here with us. So that means things like uh, technical and professional development training, more of it, or things like certification pays. In our development services department, we know that in this budget, as some of those inspectors get more certifications, they earn a little bit more and it incentivizes them to do that. So in this budget, we have 117,000 more for technical professional development. Uh, certification pays in several of the departments, including code compliance, 326,000. And then we had a tremendous uh, desire this year to use our tuition assistance program. And in fact, uh, so much so that we're gonna recommend 50,000 more to make sure everybody can use that program uh, as, uh, as, they, as they need to. And then a new initiative, our, our CDL, our commercial driver's license. In the past, we've sourced that out to uh, train drivers. Uh, but we think that uh, through David Layfeld's leadership and working with Public Works and other heavy equipment users that we can do much better if we take it in-house. And so we have 276,000 to train our own CDL drivers, put them in like an apprenticeship program, and there's going to have to be a guarantee that they stay with the city for a few years after they go through the entire program. Uh, but that's one of our areas of weakness given the labor issue is getting those certified uh, CDL drivers, certified drivers. And so by doing it in-house and closely watching the employee and keeping them here kind of as an intern and then a full-time employee, we think that's going to work. So we're nearing the end. This is just a chart uh, that shows our positions. Um, it's, uh, I'd like to look at it in a positive way. We know some people say you have too many people, you need to start cutting, but our community uh, is in dire need for more service all the way around. So this is a record setting, uh, reaching over 4,000 employees. You can see on the right some of the main attribute, uh, attributing factors to that. We're adding uh, over 250 employees to this budget. Uh, some of those are in the form of police and fire. Uh, some come from the transfer of the county employee. We hired all the county employees as part of that health district remodel. Uh, and so a total of over 4,000, but 
every one of these employees we know and we hear testimony constantly of how much the community uh, benefits from their service and how much they rely on it. So uh, some next steps coming up for the council and the community is we do have, as I mentioned, uh, four council budget workshops. We'll go into much greater detail uh, in all these high priority areas. We have five community input sessions that matter. Every budget in the past three years that I've presented to council after going out to the community, even via uh, WebEx when we had the, the pandemic, we made adjustments to the budget to reflect the consensus of the community. Uh, we have public hearings here in the council chambers and then a first reading on the budget August 30th and then budget adoption on September 6th. So Mayor, before I conclude, uh, we do have to highlight some of our employee teams that, uh, that have helped make this possible. Uh, we know that our budget office has worked extensively uh, over the last several months, uh, giving up their 4th of July break, their nights, even their weekends. We've been, all of us have been here the past couple of weekends. So I want to point them out, they're here in the audience with us, but Constance, we know Constance Sanchez, our Chief Financial Officer, is the lead. And Eddie Houlihan, our budget director, is here with us. Thank you, Eddie. And then over there, we have Christine Garza. Christine, yeah, Camille Taurus is here. Camille, great job. We have Melinda Cantu Martin, Donna Vickers, Vanessa Sanchez. Uh, new is John, uh, not new, but John uh, Juarez, right? There you go, John. And then JR is new, JR Barantitos, right? Okay. And then Kelly Davis as well. We want to give these fine. Uh, uh, men and women, a round of applause for the work that they've done. Right? <laughs> Great, so Mayor, that concludes uh, the budget presentation. I just did want to recap to say that it's a record-setting budget. It's $1.4 billion, one of the largest or the largest in the city. It has the greatest number of newly added police officers in decades. The same can be said with fire. It has the highest amount for street maintenance ever in the city. It has the, uh, the most robust stormwater program to date in our city, keeping our bays and, and creeks clean. It, it has a new economic development department in focus with the mayor. Uh, it has the biggest budget for spay and neuter services ever in the city to address our pet population. And we do this with the greatest number of employees, over 4,000 uh, well-trained uh, professionals and all of our 28 departments will help uh, advance the city forward. So, Mayor, that concludes this presentation.